the title is the wrong data, but I'm going to tell you a coral pink mohair jumper on the 1st of October is also the wrong jumper. I am absolutely <laughs> boiling. Um, right, so can I get everyone who is between the ages of 25 and 49 to please stand up? No, oh, that's annoying. I know, I know. Okay, I want you to uh, remain standing. If you have ever had any kind of test or routine kind of screening or any kind of routine test that's been happened to you, remain standing. Okay. And I want you to remain standing if you have a cervix. I've got some very good news for you cervical people. You have a significantly lower chance of getting dementia. You can take a seat now. I also kind of wanted everyone to stand up and be like, yes, I've got a cervix in the IAT. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a wee bit confused, uh, to be honest, I was as well. When I was looking at electronic medical records, and no matter which way I analyzed the data, every time I looked at it, this really, really strong signal, 20 years before people were diagnosed, was if you attend your cervical smear exam, you are way less likely to get dementia. And though whilst the rest of my PhD continued to look at electronic medical records, I spent most of my side time exploring why actually that was the wrong data set to be looking at in the first place. So just to take a step back. Most of the data that is collected in electronic medical records, people don't know really gets collected. I think for most people, you wouldn't really consider that if you go and walk into your GP practice, they're collecting quite a lot of information about you. So when you go and you talk about your kind of latest ailment, they'll be recording that information. And these boxes are free text, but also using these enormous drop-down menus that have basically categorized all of health and medicine. And these are usually things that look a bit like this. So they're type 2 diabetes and their low back pain, acute upper respiratory infection. And these are things that are really, really helpful for researchers like myself to then look into these data sets and try and analyze them. They're structured data. And we have this amazing privilege in the UK whereby we have an opt-out system, which means that actually people like me get access to your data, and you, that only doesn't happen unless you choose to opt out. Now, you might not think that's a good thing. It's an amazing thing in some respects because it means that the scale and the volume of the data we have access to is incredible. So my data set alone for primary care data has 11 million patients in it. So you probably didn't know that I had access to that anyway, but thank you so much for that um, implicit <laughs> consent. Now, these data sets, whilst being very, very big, are also kind of messy and have weird quirks. So I'm forever getting rid of people in the data set that are 250 years old or people who have tens, if not hundreds, of different healthcare events years after they die. There's also lots of weird things that get coded in electronic medical records. And uh, I don't know if any of you are into kind of perilous papier-mâché, but you can quite literally have activities involved in arts and handcrafts coded in your EMR. Depending on what sort of kind of collisions you're into, you can literally have pedestrian on foot injured in collision with roller coaster, roller skater, sorry, subsequent encounter coded. If, if you're particularly clumsy, don't worry, you are represented in the electronic medical record. You can have walked into a lamppost, comma, subsequent encounter. And my, I think my absolute favourite, and this is, you can kind of imagine that all the people that come up with these disease ontologies are kind of sitting around the table at the end of the day. You know, they're, trying, they're really late and wanting to pick their kid up from ballet and they've had a few too many beers. And they're just saying, you know, we need to make sure that we've represented all Animal Kingdom events. I know, we've missed one. Struck by an orca in this one encounter. <laughs> so these are all the things that can be coded in your electronic medical record. And by and large, obviously, those sorts of codes are not regularly used. But as a researcher, I take data like this and I try and find any early signs and symptoms of patterns of dementia. So as Siddhartha really beautifully, eloquently and saved me a couple of minutes of time um, described dementia, one of the big issues is that by the time you're symptomatic in terms of the symptoms that we really associate with cognitive decline, like memory loss, like change in behaviour, like agitation, that's almost too late. So my PhD looked at whether we take the patients who have dementia and we take them at the symptomatic stage if we look back maybe 10, 15 years, what are the symptoms of the pre-symptomatic patients? What is that kind of 10 to 15 years prior to diagnosis dementia phenotype? And so I get data that quite literally, this is not, this is um, a synthetic example, but quite literally looks like this, and it comes in spreadsheets, and it's anonymized or pseudo-anonymized patient data. And I take these data, and I do various different kinds of data science analyses. So I'll do things like network analyses, and you see these on Twitter where you have these like nodes and edges zooming around the page. And so in this case, 
nodes are the disease, prescriptions, symptoms, procedures, and the edges and the number of patients that have different types of diseases. And by visualizing the whole pre-diagnostic period of dementia as a network, you can try and find the links and interrelations between these different types of symptoms. Another type of analysis I do is using the same framework that Amazon uses. So you know that you have, you, know, you bought a seed, people like you also bought a pot. You can use that framework, but to predict the next kind of healthcare events. So I do, people like you, you, know, you had an x-ray, people like you then had a depression diagnosis, people then like you had a depression medication, and, 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 and then you can ultimately predict dementia. So I really kind of throw in the kitchen sink of all data science methods at these data sets to do this really exploratory analysis about what the whole 20 years prior to dementia really looks like. But no matter which way I analyze the data, this just kept on coming back as a signal. I just thought, bloody hell. And I was looking for some really interesting physiological biomarker. And I just kept on getting this one. And as a data scientist, I'm not amazingly good at actually giving clinical insight. I'm there to predict things very, very crudely. Um, but after speaking to uh, various doctors and epidemiologists, it became abundantly clear of what this, this random little diagnostic code was actually telling us about early dementia. And it's the fact that people who attend their cervical screening are, by and large, of a much higher socioeconomic status. So really, by picking up whether you attend your screening or not, you're just really picking up a latent variable for socioeconomic status. Now, we know that if you are, by and large, healthier, by and large, better educated, by and large, a more activated patient, you're probably just generally going to be at less risk of some of these very, very chronic, highly comorbid diseases like dementia. But we've also heard today in slightly different ways on numerous occasions, and Mark explicitly said it, is that our healthcare isn't really that made up, that, that much made up by our actual healthcare. Our health is made up a little bit by things like the NHS, the drugs we take, the scans we have. It's about 25% our genetics, which by and large we can't change, and the one that's kind of really prominent in dementia is the APOE gene. But the rest, the rest of the kind of two thirds, what's that data? So that's the data that's called your social determinants of health. And that really is that what makes you you is where you live, who you love, what you eat, where do you work, what you spend your time doing. Now, the slight difficulty is there's literally thousands of researchers like myself who are using clinical data sets to predict clinical outcomes, which is fine. But you're kind of, in some respects, almost using data that's a bit too late to unfundamentally predict the next disease. So as the further I got back in the dementia, pre-dementia cycle, I thought, well, the data is getting sparser and sparser, and the signals are getting more and more spurious, and we're kind of running out of data. And so I thought, well, where can you get this social determinants of health data? And so alongside my PhD, I've spent the last couple of years interviewing any CIO, CDO, CTO of consumer data companies who'd be willing to talk to me. I'm a kind of data person. I don't really do conversations. So uh, the qualitative research was like a big, big uh, leap of faith for me. But it was absolutely fascinating and terrifying simultaneously. So by consumer data company, I mean any company that basically collects data about an individual. So these could be banks, these could be shops, these could be digital streaming devices, basically any company that is in some way digitizing the information that people give. And there were kind of three groups of people when I asked them, are you doing anything with your data when it comes to health? And the first group was like, no, no, that's ridiculous. We're a bank. Why on earth would we have anything to do with healthcare? That's an absurd question. GDPR is too relevant. You know, don't waste my time. Fine. The second group of people said, oh, no, 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 we are a logistics company. And uh, you know, we, we really don't patter in health at all. And that's really not relevant. And it's not going to be in our business model anytime soon. And then when pushed a little bit harder, they said, oh, well, actually, we do, um, we do use our logistics routes to also partner, with a, partner up with a charity and check in on people who are really lonely. And we can basically make use of that data to make sure that we really have identified who's lonely in the community, which, for me, I find is an inherently healthcare-related activity. And the third group, and I think this is something that we should both be very excited and quite concerned about, is companies, big, multinational in some cases, companies, that were explicitly linking their data, sometimes not in a consented way, with electronic medical records, which basically means that any variable that a data, a data company is collecting, when linked with an EMR, all of a sudden becomes a digital biomarker. So what does that mean? It means that the random spurious bits of activity that is collected in the digital ether all of a sudden has a clinical representation. 
And one of the examples that was given was a mobile phone company. And they found that they could very, very accurately find clinical correlates with these kind of seemingly random passive bits of data collected on your mobile phone. And they could very, very accurately predict different types of mental health crises. So cervical smear is a kind of meaningless, somewhat meaningless biomarker in some respects. It's one of these new digital biomarkers because it's in an EMR, but it doesn't actually represent what it's saying it represents. But nevertheless, it really, really beautifully correlates with the diagnosis of dementia. But this could just as easily be the pattern of movement from your mobile phone, and it could just as easily be the song genre you're listening to. And what's, I think, very interesting is that those companies that are explicitly trying to draw the link are doing it largely behind closed doors. I really struggle to find any papers published in the open. There are plenty of papers and studies that mimic the data collected by these companies. They will say, download an app. We will be able to track and use all the passive data from your mobile phone. We will be able to run a trial. Great, but if you go to any of the mobile phone providers, they have that on bank already. And I'm a kind of frugal person. I like, I like electronic health records because they're there. Yeah, they're messy. Yeah, you can be struck by an orca in them, but they're there. And that's a really beneficial and valuable thing to be able to do, is to be able to take data that's collected as a byproduct of routine activity. Because by and large, when we're looking to predict diseases, we don't really know what symptoms, what features we need to be using in order to predict those conditions. Because if we're using the ones that we think are very symptomatic with the condition, in the case of dementia, things like memory loss, memory loss, funnily enough, doesn't appear 20 years before you're diagnosed, because it's a late stage symptom. So what will the health data organizations of tomorrow be? Companies take so much of your data to then sell you back things that you don't really want or need. But it would be amazing if that was flipped a bit. And whilst you know, simultaneously taking all of your data, they were using that for beneficial purposes, like healthcare. Now, there are so many moral, ethical, and technical issues with that sort of statement. But in different pockets, in different ways, lots of organizations are doing some things to concretely allow some of those partnerships to happen be it the same sort of APIs that open banking used, or data trusts. There are increasingly mechanisms by which to link some of these data sets and use these seemingly non-healthcare data sets at scale. So there were, you know, maybe 20 people um, at the beginning who stood up, who very proudly had a cervix. But I would like you to put your hand up if you've checked Google even once this last week. Right there is the richest longitudinal social determinants of health data set. And some of these companies are already using it for that purpose. And you really still don't know about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>